and the beauty and joy of computing. So, enjoy. Great, thank you. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk about SNAP. Uh, and this is a slogan of our scheme disguised as Scratch. Um, and it kind of begs two questions. One is, why would you want Scheme? And the other is, uh, if you have Scheme, why would you want to disguise it as Scratch? Um, I'm mostly not going to talk about the first of those. Uh, we just take as given that Scheme is God's programming language. Uh, and this is the Bible, Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs. And, and our goal in life is to go around spreading the good tidings um, of SIGP to the world. So that's an assumption. Uh, overview of the talk. Part one, um, what's a scheme? By which I mean, uh, what does it mean to say that SNAP is scheme disguised as scratch? Uh, so I'm going to go just list a few of the things that make a language a scheme and show how we do them. Part two, how does visual programming help? So this is why do we want to disguise it as scratch? Uh, part three is, how does visual programming hurt? There are some ways that, that we feel a little constrained by the language um, in a way that like the bootstrap gang is not constrained by theirs. Uh, and finally, a few minutes on the beauty and joy of computing, um, which is SIGP disguised as CS principles. Um, OK. So uh, I'm going to sit down. What's a scheme? Um, and the first thing, of course, to make something a scheme is the first classness of procedures and lists and continuations. Um, so can you see this? Um, if I click on 2 plus 3, I get 5. If I have a ring around the 2 plus 3 and I click on it, I get the 2 plus 3 block. So that gray ring is lambda. And yes, I know that technically there shouldn't be a gray ring around the answer. And yes, I know that technically a procedure is more than its text. There's also a remembered environment, and that's all true. But in terms of presenting a new idea to kids, uh, this is how we do it. Um, so it's no good having functions unless you can call them. Um, so here we have the function box plus 3, empty box plus 3. And I'm calling it with the input 5, and I get 8. So um, this is a way that we finesse formal parameters. Um, we actually learned this from the new math curricula of the early days, uh, where they found that with 8-year-olds, um, if you say x plus 3 equals 7, what's x? You don't get an answer, but if you say box plus 3 equals 7, what goes in the box, you do. So we're trying to appeal to that property of the mind. Um, here's first class lists. We have a list constructor. Um, we can also make lists of lists, and they look a little different. So actually, let me back up. Um, this is what lists look like in Scratch, a gray box with the red boxes inside for the elements. But if it's a two-dimensional list, this is a pretty new feature in Snap. We, uh, uh oh, I'm running out behind time. We display it as a spreadsheet. Um, so that helps in talking about data. So here's just an example about continuations. Um, oops. I have this little program here. It says, move 50 steps, turn 15 plus call CC of uh, store the continuation in global variable foo, report 30. So it's going to turn 45 degrees and then move 50 steps. And uh, you can see that's what it did. I'm sorry? I'm hoping that we'll do them all at the end. OK? Uh, there should be time for that. Um, but now I want to actually run this continuation foo, and I'm going to give it the input 75. So what should happen is we turn 15 plus 75, which is 90 degrees, and move 50 steps. And sure enough, that's what happens. So there you are, first class continuations. Um, lexical scope. In order to be a scheme, it has to be lexically scoped. Um, and it is. So uh, let me show you 
make a counter. This is you know right out of SIGP. Um, uh, let count be zero and uh, return lambda of message. So this outer ring is the dispatch procedure. If message equals next, report the next method, which adds one to count. If message equals reset, report the reset message, which takes an input uh, and sets the counter to that value. Otherwise, report the method, give an error message. So the dispatch procedure turns messages into methods. And the point of it is that this count um, is a, uh, local, a persistent local state variable. So um, if I make, whoops, if I make a couple of counters, I can ask counter one next. I get one, two, three, four, five. Let's ask counter two next. One, two. Counter one still remembers six. Uh, I can ask counter one to reset to 100. <coughs> and then counter one will count 101, 102, 103. And counter two still remembers where it was up to. So that's um, lexical scope used to provide local state. Um, uniform syntax, even for special forms. So in scheme, something like if, uh, it looks as if it were a procedure call, even though it isn't. Right? It isn't because of things like um, not evaluating its arguments. It's a special form. But it still has that parenthesis, blum, 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 uh, notation. And whoops. And so do we. Um, <coughs> this is a primitive uh, if then else for commands. So if some condition is satisfied, then do this. Otherwise, do this. It's a built-in special form. Um, we also have reporter if, which I wrote in snap. And you can see it in use here. If n equals 0, then 1. Otherwise, n times n minus 1 factorial. <coughs> and sure enough, if I run it, it works. Now, in order for that to work, these two inputs have to not be pre-evaluated even though we're um, an applicative order language. How does that happen? Because when I define this if block, uh, I'm going to zoom in here a little. Um, instead of defining this input to be of type any, we define it to be of type any unevaluated, which means to the user it looks like a regular old input, but secretly, it's a reporter. It's a, it's a function slot. It has a lambda wrapped around it that you can't see. Um, so that's how we make special forms that look just like procedures. Um, macros. Uh, well, we're about halfway there. I showed you um, the half of macros that has to do with preventing them from evaluating their inputs. The other half of macros is that they come up with an expression that's then evaluated in the caller's context. Uh, we don't have that yet, but it's on our list of features. Um, the true scheme numeric tower, um, well, not really. Um, by default, we use the underlying, oh, whoops, I turned it on. Ah. By default, we use the underlying JavaScript arithmetic. Um, but we have this library that um, I can say use big nums. And then um, I get an exact rational one third. And furthermore, I can do 40 factorial. Uh, and the only reason I'm not doing 100 factorial is it's too wide to fit on the screen. Um, but we can do it. Uh, and we get a, you know, a big num answer. Um, scheme is a Lisp one that has a single namespace for everything. Alas, that's not true for us. We inherited from scratch the fact that I can have a variable foo, which actually contains a continuation right now. Um, that's what it looks like. It's not a very correct picture for continuations, but 
That's on our list to fix. And I also have a procedure foo that just returns foo foo. Um, and um, so, sorry, what can I say? <coughs> um, oh, finally, tail call elimination. That's very important part of being a scheme. Um, we do it. Uh, I'm going to set foo to zero and run this procedure tail. And tail says change foo by one, call tail. Okay, so it just runs forever. And um, you can see the value of foo counting up slowly. If I go into uh, turbo mode, which means spend more time on running than on redisplay, um, it counts up faster. And I don't know how far you want me to count up before you're convinced that I'm not going to get a stack overflow. But I'm really not. Um, OK. That's, so that's my what's a scheme. And that's the, the sense in which we are a scheme. Um, <coughs> so how does visual programming help? So one of the things we inherit from scratch, which is a really important point with young beginner programmers, is that you can't make a syntax error. Um, so what that means is um, if I uh, pick up this foo thing, I can drag it in here. But if I pick up this block, which is a command block, it just won't go. The language won't let me make a syntax error. Uh, and I discover this as I'm making it rather than later on when the program is running. Um, <clears throat> OK, so that's great. And also, we get that you don't have to be good at typing, which is really important for kids. Um, visual metaphors for advanced ideas. OK, pretend you're a high school student. You've never seen recursion. OK, class, um, here's this program that I wrote called V. And what it does is it turns left a little bit. It moves forward a little bit. Then it picks a random one of these blocks and runs it. So it either draws a square, or it draws a hexagon, or it draws a star. Um, and you, by this point in the course, you know how to do those things. Um, then we move back, turn right, move out again, and again, pick a random shape and draw it, and then move back to the starting position and direction. So here we have star hexagon. If I run it, we get star square, square star, star star, <coughs> sorry, uh, square hexagon. Let me actually... It's a very important part of computer science. Um, so now, the question is, what will happen if I add V, whoops, stop that. If I add V to this list of possible decorations. So remember, here's what the code looks like. This is what V does. So, you know, in your notebook, sketch a picture of what you think might result if we actually pick V. Wait a few minutes, kids think about that. OK, let's try it and see. Oh, sometimes we just get the same old thing. Sometimes we get this. This is what a lot of people draw. That's what they expect to see. And sometimes we get this. And the first time that happens, everybody gasps. You know, wow. OK? So that's our first lesson on recursion. Um, but for the purposes of this talk, I want to call attention to this list of blocks. Um, a lot of kids are experienced scratch programmers, so they know what a list looks like. And in any event, we've introduced lists earlier in the curriculum. And they all know what a block looks like, because they use them all the time to make scripts. But none of them have ever seen a list of blocks before. But it's so obvious what this is that they don't even ask about it. It just makes sense. And this is something that everybody says is too hard to teach kids. But we can because we have this visual representation. 
So that's the biggest thing that we gain from pretending to be Scratch. Oops, uh, that wasn't what I meant. What I meant was that. Okay, lambda built into higher order functions. Um, what does that mean? Well, here's the map block, and here's keep, otherwise known as filter. And here's combine, otherwise known as accumulate, otherwise known as reduce. Um, and they take functions and lists as their arguments. So I can take the function blank plus three and stick it in here and put a list of numbers in here and say map that, and I get seven plus three, eight plus three, and one plus three. Okay. Now, this all by itself is a function. Right? If I click on it all by itself, I get three because this is taken as zero. But if I stick it in something that's expecting a function, then it works like a function. I don't have to teach kids about how to make a gray ring um, or how to write a function like map that uses gray rings in order to do uh, this kind of list processing. I can just use it and it's there. And that's one of the great things um, about this visual representation is that it's just there so we can postpone some of the harder ideas about what's really going on here. I'm not going to bother showing you keep and combine uh, so that I get back on schedule for time. Upvars. What's an upvar? Um, we invented this. Um, so there's this block four. Um, it's a user-defined block. Here it is. Um, don't bother reading the whole thing. It's only complicated because it wants to be able to count up or down. Um, but it has four input slots, um, I, start, and action. Action is the C-shaped slot. Um, I is an upvar. So if I look at its um, type declaration, instead of having one of these types checked, it has this button here. It says, make internal variable visible to caller. So what that means is that the scope of this variable is the for block. But it's exported, looking just like a variable, to be dragged into the script that the for is running. So we can change the name. The reason this says i and this says k is that I clicked on this, and I can change the name to anything I want. Uh, I can, but then there's going to be a problem in here. Um, by the way, 30 years ago or so, when I wrote Computer Science Logo Style, um, one of you programming language people yelled at me for saying that a variable combines a name and a value. Um, so, in the second edition, I fixed it. I put in a little footnote that really uh, the variable has a location and a value, and separate from the variable, there's a binding from the name to the location. Um, so, I made it right. But I never understood why you guys thought it mattered <laughs> until we had to implement four, where we have to have this variable have two different names in two different environments, but be the same variable. So if I change it in here, if I give it a new value, that change is seen uh, by the rest of the program. So thank you for teaching me that. Uh, it came, it, you're, yeah, <laughs> good. It came in very handy. Um, OK. Um, sprites as natural objects. So this is a breakout game. Um, it's not very interesting because it's just going up and down, but that's okay. It doesn't matter because what I want to talk about about it is that um, the paddle and the ball and the bricks are each objects. Um, you know, in the real oop sense of the word, they have their own 
method. So here's the programming for the ball, and here's the programming for the paddle, oh, I'm sorry, for the brick, and here's the programming for the paddle. And um, does the stage have a program? No, it doesn't, but it could. Uh, and these things can interact with each other both by um, detecting if I'm touching sprite 3, then do this, and also they can actually send each other messages. Um, uh, in Scratch, only by broadcast, uh, but in Snap, you can direct a message to a particular sprite. Um, so they're already objects, and the kids understand them as objects, you know, they, as sort of having purposes, each one individually. Um, so it's just another tiny little step to make an object system with inheritance. I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah. Um, so Alonzo is the parent of dog, dog is the parent of bat. We've set it up that way. Um, Alonzo has these two variables, foo and bar. If I change the value of Alonzo's foo, you'll see that dog and bat follow those changes. Same for bar. Um, if we look at dog, whoops, dog, forgot how my own language works. If you look up here, it has variables foo and bar, but they're kind of ghosted out. So that means we can use these variables, we can drag them into scripts, but I don't own them. This variable belongs to my parent, and I'm inheriting it. So it's not a copy, it's a real sharing. Um, by inheritance from a prototype. Um, now, I can change that. So if I slide the dog foo slider, what happens is that bat follows dog, Alonzo does not follow dog, and now if you look on the left here, foo is a real variable in dog. It's its own variable, whereas bat is still inheriting both foo and bar. It's inheriting foo from dog and bar still from Alonzo. Um, I could slide the bar slider, and now bat has its own bar, um, but not its own foo. Uh, dog has its own foo, but not its own bar, and of course Alonzo owns both of them. So um, Alonzo, nobody's following Alonzo, but bat is following dog, whereas in this bar variable, dog is following Alonzo, but now bar isn't. Notice, by the way, that the watchers indicate by the color whether this is your own variable or your parents' variable. So this is uh, inheritance through prototyping. Um, it works great. It's not 100% finished. Uh, we don't have it for methods yet, just variables, but that's coming. Um, so that sort of gives us a natural in to object-oriented programming. And one more little detail, um, zebra coloring. Uh, here's a little script that computes the quadratic formula. Um, even when you have things correctly indented, reading parenthesized code that's so many levels deep uh, gives you a headache. Um, I'm not going to claim that this doesn't give you a headache, but it's a little better because we alternate dark and light versions of the blocks as you nest the same category. And that's just a, a godsend of no intellectual importance, but important for a kid being able to read code, uh, even who own his or her own code. So that's how it helps. Um, how does visual programming hurt? Now, this is maybe the interesting part of the talk. Um, the distinction between commands and reporters. A command is a procedure that does something but does not return a value. A reporter does return a value, which we call reporting a value, because that's what Scratch calls it. Um, and what that means is a lot of time we need two different versions of things. So we have, I showed you already, command if versus reporter if. We have uh, two versions of apply 
The one for commands is called run. The one for reporters is called call. Uh, we have two different versions of catch and throw. Catch and throw, of course, are built out of call CC. Um, and there's a command catch throw and a reporter catch throw. And the reporter one is especially messy because um, you can put an input value in here. But oops, I actually want to put um, a throw command in here. So I have to say call this block because otherwise you can't stick the command block into the value input. So pain in the butt. Uh, run CC, call CC, um, tell the sprite to do a command versus ask the sprite for a reporter. This is how we send messages, by the way. Um, so that's a problem. Um, we inherited a kind of messy um, way to determine if two block names are the same, or if two blocks are the same. Um, so not only is it a Lisp2, so variables are a special case. There are other special cases, too, like this green length of block for text strings and this red length of block for lists. Um, and you know we inherit that from scratch, really. Um, and someday we'll straighten it out. Um, the biggest problem, and I, this, I hope this is what the discussion time is about, so you can tell me what to do about this. The biggest problem is that the graphicness pushes us away from functional programming and toward sequential programming. So um, as an example, Uh, this is count change from chapter one of the Bible. Um, it indicates branched recursion. It's, you know, given th these denominations of coins, how many ways are there to make such and such an amount of money? Um, and it turns out you add ways that use the first coin to ways that don't use the first coin, basically. Um, so if I run this, I click on it, and it waits for a while thinking, and then finally it tells me 500 and something. But yeah, different ways to make a dollar 37 um, with these coins. But this is not very compelling um, if you're a kid. Why would I want to have this function? So what we ended up doing for this example is enter an amount of money. So I'll Enter $1. thirty-seven, and out comes, you know, five quarters a dime and two pennies, down to four quarters a dime, five, four nickels, seven pennies. And um, if I let it run long enough, we'll finally get to uh, 137 pennies. Um, now, even this is not like, you know, playing a video game. But it's much more compelling to kids. They can see why I might want to have a program that does this uh, rather than the function. Um, so that's just an example of um, the ways in which we get pushed towards uh, doing things imperatively. Um, the fact that we have um, a multi-threaded model of execution ends up pushing us towards global variables as a way to communicate information, um, things like that. So this is you know, the, the big problem with my life, um, is I try to do things functionally, and we get pushback from teachers who say, why are you doing it in this complicated way when well, you could do it more simply you know, this way? Um, so that's what I need help with. Um, oops, I beeped. Uh, and another one that's um, not quite so central, but still kind of central. Um, when you're programming a text language, if you're writing a procedure and you want to call another procedure that you haven't written yet, you just type its name in as if you had written it and worry about it later. We can't do that 
when the way you call a procedure is by dragging a block in out of the palette. Um, so we have to uh, write stubs. Back in the old Pascal days, they used to talk about stubs all the time. And we end up having to do that, and it's a pain in the neck. Um, and it's, it's imposed on us by visual programming. OK, um, <clears throat> we're getting toward the home stretch here with five minutes to go. That's great. Um, the beauty and joy of computing um, is our curriculum out of Berkeley um, that uh, we are promulgating as a high school curriculum. Um, it's a CS principles curriculum. So in the United States, um, there's this movement that's 10 years old now, um, started by uh, Jan Cooney at the National Science Foundation. Uh, she wanted uh, more women and minorities in computer science and said, let's have a course that doesn't drive them away. Um, but because it's the United States, uh, the course was designed as an advanced placement course. Um, so there's this testing group called the College Board. Uh, they make up the tests for all college students. They make up you know, the tests for getting into college in the first place. Um, rather, and they also have um, tests for college level courses taught in high school. Why do we want to be an AP course? Doesn't that work against saying it's a course for everybody? Um, yes, it does. But uh, we don't have, the way you do in Britain and New Zealand and those other places, a national education authority that can impose a curriculum on everyone. Uh, the curriculum comes out of each individual school district. So to get a course into every high school in America, either you have to knock on the door of every school district in America, or you have to finesse that by it being an AP class, which everybody accepts. Um, so that's why it's an AP. Um, but it's not like the uh, still existing old APCS. Uh, that course is a course in programming in Java, God help us. Um, this course, uh, programming is just one of seven big ideas. Let's see if I can get it. Creativity. I hate that. Creativity is nice, and I want kids to be creative, but I don't know how to talk about creativity with kids. It's, you know. Anyway, um, abstraction, yay, good for them. Um, data is one. Um, global impact, meaning you know, the social implications of computing, is one, good for them. Um, I forget the others. But, oh, no, algorithms, that's one. Anyway, um, so it's not just programming. Um, this year is the first year of the actual AP exam. Um, BJC is one of several CS principles curricula. What the College Board did was issue a framework, right? Sort of like all your national standards, this has to be taught here. Um, you know, these are the things that are part of the course. The knowledge you're supposed to get out of it, but um, there are maybe half a dozen um, sort of big time CS principles providers. We're one of them. Um, we were kind of first off the mark um, because we started it as a pilot project as a course for Berkeley students, for the university students who were not CS majors uh, before there even was the CS principles framework. Uh, but we're officially endorsed by the college board, meaning if you're a high school and you want to get approved to run a CS principles AP course, you can just say, we're following the BJC curriculum, and they'll accept that. Um, but we don't think much of the framework as, as a framework. Um, it leaves out some important stuff. Uh, and in particular, we feel we like programming more than they like programming. And so we added recursion and higher order functions uh, because we really wanted to teach them SIGP. Um, we don't, actually. We teach them maybe the first two chapters of SICP in our course. Um, so one of my goals is to have a BJC year two, but I don't know if we'll ever get funding for that, um, to teach chapters three, four, and five. 
or at least three and four. Um, I guess that's it. Uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, we aren't only interested in programming. We're also very big on the social implications of computing. That's a subject that I taught, no good, just right, um, at Berkeley. I'm now f officially retired, um, so I'm not teaching Berkeley students, but um, social implications features heavily in our curriculum, uh, second only to programming. Okay, discussion. Thank you.